so we are absolutely glad you could be here with us for our fast track to the certificate in in-depth life care um, certificate in in-depth life care program that we have here at Montgomery Hospice. Today we are offering two of our mandatory programs for the pro uh, for that certification. Um, and we are expecting a very large class today. We, are, we have about 80 people who have um, registered to attend the program, and we, we have a very diverse class joining us from um, different organizations, including Aging Network Services, Care Manager, Management Group, NIH. We have Hebrew Home. We have representation from um, Walter Reed, Kensington Senior Living. So we really have a diverse representation of uh, disciplines and organizations here with us. So if you have joined one of our online classes before, you know my role is to help facilitate the behind the scenes logistics so that our class goes smoothly. We hope to steer clear of any technological issues, um, but if any anything is to happen, we have um, backups. You'd see my colleagues, Mindy and uh, Megna, whom you might know, um, chipping in and, um, helping you with any um, issues you might encounter. So here at Montgomery Hospice, we really want you to get the best out of our programs. Um, and that means we ask you to ask question, engage. This is the perfect platform to ask questions even while our pre presenter is presenting. Um, so with that said, the chat box is going to be our main tool of communication. If you don't see the chat box on the right side of your screen, as I've said earlier, just hover down at the very bottom of your screen. You should see an, um, a messenger icon and just click on it and a chat box should appear on the right side of your screen. A reminder, just make sure that when you send a, a question or a comment, be sure the send to is set on all participants. That way we can all see the questions and um, comments because sometimes people have the same questions that you might have, same comments. So be sure that you, you're sending it to everyone. So this first session is going to focus on, we have Dr. Z here with us, and it's going to focus on how to have difficult conversations about in-depth life. Um, in-depth life is a very tough topic to, to, to talk about in general. For most professionals, hospice conversations could be extremely difficult. Um, some research actually has shown physicians tend to uh, take long to have important discussions about patients' prognosis. And right now with the climate we're in, it's just um, it's so essential to have those difficult conversations, no matter how difficult they are. So we have um, today Dr. Aziz to really help us see how to best uh, approach the subject of end-of-life life care in general. So Dr. Aziz is, um, He's a, a Montgomery Kids team physician here at Montgomery Hospice. He is um, he's a medical director of Chesapeake Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay, excuse me Kids um, medical director for the palliative care program. He is also the author of um, Courageous Conversations on Death and Dying: The Gift of Palliative Care. This is like a Bible. I carry it around with me. Such a great book. Um, and and so we have him here today to, to discuss how to have those practical conversations with, um, with patients and, and physicians in general. So Dr. Aziz, thank you so much for being here with us and um, I'm gonna just pass it on to you. Thank you, uh, good morning. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, you let Beza know. So um, the, in the talk today, it's, uh, we're talking about practical strategies for conversations on end of life and hospice. So the two main things I think I'm going to cover are how to start and what to say uh, when you want to uh, introduce hospice to someone. And the second is how to have simplified format for having adv doing advanced care planning or talking about the end of life uh, uh, goals and those conversations with someone. Um, uh, these are actually huge topics, but we have one hour. So I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. And if you, have, of course, have questions, we can have a little time for question and answer afterwards. 
And uh, if your question is not answered, you can always email me or call me, and Beza is going to give you that information how to get in touch with me. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let's let's first talk about um, Beza. Do I have a control now? Yeah. Okay. So there are no disclosures for today's talk. Here are learning objectives for the day. One is to understand the importance of having these conversations about hospice and what happens when you avoid it. Know when to have these conversations, choose words that are helpful and avoid the harmful ones and utilize strategies to introduce hospice and be better prepared to guide families and patients through death and dying. So hopefully you'll be able to do all that by the end of this hour. Now, what happens if you do not have these conversations? It results in unnecessary pain and suffering by the patient and families, overuse of futile treatments, unrealistic hope, ethical dilemmas and moral distress in the patient and families and the physicians and the care caregivers. And there's increasing conflict in family members and between them and the medical staff if these conversations do not occur. And all of this results in increased medical cost. So I'm going to give you just a brief, uh, maybe I'll just give you only one example because of the time restraints to see how having these conversations helps or does not help uh, with the decisions. So the first is a 56 year old female with diabetes. Uh, she was in an in inpatient hospital and because of all the complications of diabetes, she had had a kidney failure and uh, peripheral artery disease. And over the time she'd had both her legs amputated and now she was on dialysis in the hospital. And uh, at that time I was the chair of the ethics committee and uh, she was presented to us uh, to do an ethics consult on to decide what to do next because on the dialysis, she was being, her life was being maintained uh, already for a long time. So my first question to, of course, the uh, family and the uh, doctors was if anybody had had any conversation with her. So the answer is that she was mostly semi-conscious and you could not really have a conversation with her. But the day that she would have her dialysis, she would wake up and make sense. I was able to converse and make decisions. So we waited for the day when she had her dialysis and then we went and talked to her as to what she thought about her life right now and how did she like or not like living the way she was. And her answer was very clear. She said, I really don't want to live like this and I'd rather not be living than to be living on dialysis and be aware just one day out of three or four. So we asked her if uh, stopping treatments were, was okay with her and if she knew what the answer would be. And she said, absolutely, that is what I want and I'm ready to go. So that little conversation with her helped us make a decision to stop treatments and she, she died peacefully. The point I'm making is if these conversations had occurred with her long before this, when she started having initial issues, uh, we could have saved her and everybody else a lot of grief. So I'm just going to skip the, I'm not going to talk about the second case. So let's talk about the practical part. When to talk about palliative care and hospice. To understand what it is, palliative care we like to talk about as the diagnosis of a life limiting illness or worsening of disease. Okay. So you don't have to wait till the end of life, but if you need to start talking about palliative care and what it can, how it can help you at the beginning. If you did not do it at that time and the patient gets admitted to the hospital, that would be a good time to talk about it. Hospice is to talk about when goals of care are shifting to mainly comfort or life expectancy is now less than six months or so. So when that time comes in a patient who has a life-limiting illness, uh, that's the time to uh, talk about and introduce hospice. We ask the doctors to ask their, uh, 
to ask yourself the surprise question. Would I, would I be surprised if the patient was to die in the next year? And then the answer, the answer is no, I would not be surprised because the patient is so sick already. Then there's the time to call hospice for a concert. So you don't have to be 100% sure that the patient needs hospice, but you have to have the inkling and some reasons. And if you do, you just ask the hospice folks to do a consult to see if the patient is hospice appropriate. This way, hopefully, we won't miss a lot of the patients that could benefit from the hospice services. So how do we explain palliative care to patients? Palliative care is an additional layer of support by the palliative care team, which is a doctor, nurse, social worker, chaplain in the hospital, hospital setting or outside. And it is, it is provided right along with curative treatments. So the palliative care, as you know, now we uh, start, let's say, patients with cancer at the time of diagnosis. And studies have shown that the patients that get palliative care involved at the time of dog and diagnosis, live longer and live better. Well, also palliative care is used when they, you need management of physical symptoms, uh, help with those, and it management of psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual suffering. So palliative care uh, involves that. And it also helps with decision-making and goal-setting for now and for the future so that all are at peace, that the right things are being done for the patient. So this, the last part, is about 80% of palliative care's work. So we do a lot of talking, a lot of family meetings, a lot of goal setting, and just helping with decision making with patients. Hospice is essentially palliative care. We're doing the same thing, but it's in the last six months of patient's life. And goals of care usually at that time have shifted from life-saving aggressive treatments to mainly comfort treatments and achieving a gentle, peaceful end. So how do you introduce hospice without using the H word? Public has had this wrong impression of hospice that hospice means you're going to put them in some ward, you're going to stop all their treatments, you're going to give them morphine so they can die quickly and peacefully. But that, of course, is not hospice. So when you're going to introduce patients to hospice without using the word hospice, uh, what I, the, my approach is to talk about what hospice does and see if that is agreeable to the patient. So if I'm talking to a patient in a hospital, first I clarify his goals. So to see that goals now are shifting from aggressive treatments to keeping the patient comfortable. And then I say, well, for these goals, how about if we offer you support services at home? So the nurse comes to your home, a social worker comes, a chaplain and volunteers, and we can manage your symptoms at home. We can change the medications. There's 24 seven access to nurse and physician. Um, and the patient's physician can also be part of the team. And you don't really have to rush back to the hospital all the time to ma manage any changes in medication or symptoms. So all this can be managed at home. And then I ask the patient, how does this sound to you? And the majority of patients at that time say, well, that sounds very good. I probably have to be at home and the nurse comes there. I don't have to come back to the hospital. And all I want now, of course, is to be comfortable uh, and I don't want any more aggressive treatments and surgeries and so on. So then I say, well, that can be provided to you. And by the way, that service is called hospice. So now that you know what it is, there is not that much uh, fear of the word hospice. Whenever I have presented to the patient's hospice in this manner, I've yet to have a patient refuse getting involved with hospice. And we also tell them, of course, that if the symptoms get very severe and we cannot control them in the home and we think they need additional help that we cannot provide in the home, we have inpatient units uh, where we can take them and provide those services, but they don't necessarily have to come back to the hospital. 
And we also tell them that they can uh, opt out of the hospice anytime they want. And if they wish uh, to absolutely come to the hospital, they can, but we will involve, involve and help them with those decisions. So hospice is not a fast track to the end. It is simply choosing a smoother ride for the journey. It is about celebrating life, living the best you can, and it's not doom and gloom. Then we talk about the benefits of the hospice to the patient, the families. Patients in hospice live longer, they live better, they have a better quality of life because their symptoms are managed so much better and they have all the support of extra folks. Uh, they die more peacefully. There's less emergency room visits. There's less non-beneficial treatments. So the treatments, and the way I present to the family is the treatment that are of benefit to the patient will be given. Those that are of no benefit will either be stopped or not given. We support for family by team of professional is there. So the family doesn't have to go through this difficult time all alone. And there's a peace of mind for all that we are doing the best we can and uh, we, with all the benefit that can and the right things are being done. And then of course there is a decreased cost. So, so that's a very simple way of presenting uh, what hospice is and what it can do for you. A part of that conversation when we talk about hospice is to talk about patients advanced care planning or goal setting or thinking about their hopes and wishes and their values on which we base our decisions. So the ethical dilemma between before any of the healthcare providers is if I'm prolonging, uh, here's the ethical dilemma. Am I prolonging a meaningful life by artificially life prolonging treatments or am I just prolonging the dying process and the suffering of the patient? And wouldn't it be better to not prolong that life artificially but let the patient die in peace? So what is artificially prolonging treatments? Most people, if I were to ask you, most people think about the ventilator, the dialysis, maybe the pacemaker or the defibrillator. But artificial treatments can be as simple as treatment for your diabetes, insulin, antibiotics for your infection, um, thyroid medication, heart medicines, medicines for your blood pressure. So, and in addition, artificial nutrition and hydration. All of those are treatments without which the patient's life would be shortened. So the question comes up is, if I'm helping prolong somebody's life, am I prolonging a meaningful life for him or not? So now we are on to the advanced care planning part, okay? So how do you, so, there, so this is what advanced care planning is. It is prevention against crisis-driven, desperate, irrational, emotional, and expensive decision-making. So we're going to prevent all that if we do the advanced care planning. If you have not had any conversation and plan anything ahead of time, then in a crisis, you're going to make all these uh, decisions that are not very good. Advanced care planning is also facilitating discussions to identify the patient's goals, values, and desires our outcomes. In other words, trying to find out what is meaningful to that patient. It is also helping with decisions so all are at peace, that the right things are being done. And this is a means to formulating advanced directives. Advanced care planning, these conversations and discussions by itself is not an advanced directive, but it's just knowing what is important to the patient. Many times, most of the time, these discussions will lead into a document, which is your advanced directive, writing down what your wishes are. And the key, again, is the early and repeated patient and family meetings where you can talk about all of this. This is the best gift that you 
And uh, if you're doing your own advanced care planning, um, or the, this is the best gift that the patient or one can give to their family. Because if you lose your capacity to make decisions, then somebody else is making decisions for you, and usually is one of your family members. And when that happens, that is a huge burden on the shoulder of the family. Anytime I've helped people make these decisions where they're trying to make a decision for their loved one or made the decision for them because things are so clear cut, they're always so grateful that now they don't have to live with the thought that their decision ended their loved one's life. So this is the best gift you can give your, your loved ones. And if any of you have not had these discussions or don't have advanced directives, I implore you that you please do that for yourself as well. And actually, um, if uh, afterwards uh, we'd like you to send a, a note to Beza as to how many of you worked on your own advanced care planning after this talk or helped others do and what kind of a results we got. We can actually take a poll right now. I have a poll um, that I would like to take whether or not you have an advanced directive. Okay. I am opening up that poll right now. Um, and you guys can go ahead and respond to it. I'll give you a few minutes. Should I carry on in the meantime? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, really, I, I very seriously, I, I tell people at the next Christmas, there's no need to spend money on anything, but you just need to uh, spend your efforts on uh, having these conversations with your loved ones. And that will be the gift that you can give. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, when do we do this? So you can do advanced care planning to, uh, to talk to the patient at a regular office visit. You don't have to be sick to be doing advanced care planning. Um, I didn't mind maybe 20 years ago. And, uh, or if you did not do it at that time, talk to your patient at any illness or hospital admission, or at initial diagnosis of a life limiting illness, or at a hospital admission with a life limiting illness. If not, at least at an admission to an ICU admission. You'll be surprised how many patients have had multiple ICU admissions and no advanced care planning. Uh, so that's really our fault for not having brought it up with the patients. And why the urgency and why the time is now today to do it? Because you don't know when you're going to lose your decision-making capacity. So we want to establish these minimum thresholds of living while the patient still has that capacity. A reminder to patients and everybody else, just because you had this conversation today, just because you made an advanced directive today and wrote down what you wanted is not etched in stone and it may be changed anytime as long as the patient has the capacity to make decisions. So it's better to write something today even if you're not totally sure, because tomorrow you can change it. Without that, your family is stuck in a very difficult place. One of the parts of having these conversations and an advanced directive is to uh, have a POA or advocate, power of attorney for healthcare decisions. So you need to choose somebody that you can uh, who can make decisions for you if you have lost your capacity to make decisions. So my advice is to choose somebody who is a little removed, not too close to you and not too emotional, so that who can make more rational, reasonable decisions. Uh, it doesn't have to be your spouse, uh, preferably not be your spouse, be maybe somebody younger, um, and uh, your children is okay, uh, I've had uh, nephews, nieces, uh, grandchildren who have been the decision makers. So choose somebody and talk to them and talk to them about your wishes as to how you want to live or not live and see that they can support you if they have to make those decisions. 
Now, advanced directives, once you have put this down, we're going to talk about later about the uh, papers. Uh, once you have the advanced directive, it comes into play when you cannot make your own decisions. So as long as you have decision-making capacity, I don't really need to look at the advanced directive. I could just talk to you as to see what your wishes may be. So once you lose your decision-making capacity and you have a life which is being prolonged by artificial means, then these decisions come in, come handy. So, uh, <clears throat> so here's a, to figure out what is your decision might be, here are the three questions that I ask. And if you answer these three questions for yourself, that's really all you need to have to do to uh, set your goals of minimum acceptable life. So the three questions are, number one, if your condition worsens, what minimum level of decreased mental awareness is acceptable to you with the help of life prolonging treatments? Second question is, what minimum level of physical functioning is acceptable to you with life prolonging treatments? In other words, if you're not at any of these two levels, then the life prolonging treatments can be essentially start because all we are doing is forcing you to live at a level you don't want to live. The third question has to do with life prolonging treatments, which are acceptable to use and for how long or not acceptable to use in an effort to get you to your minimum levels. And the reason for that uh, question is because pa patients may have experienced certain treatments that they don't want to go through again, it was so horrible. Uh, and the other question for that is that to make sure that the patients are making decisions dependent upon good information and they don't have like false uh, sense of what uh, CPR might do, what dialysis might do, and they might make the wrong decisions. So it's important to ask that third question. I'll give you an example of where this was very helpful to us. Uh, we had a lady in her 60s who had lung cancer but it was um, localized to one lobe and was small at the time. And the surgeon said that he can remove it and she would be cured. But with that, the only provision is that she'll have to be on the ventilator for about a week or so. And after that, most patients can come out of the ventilator. Occasionally, some patients are unable to get off the ventilator then she would be hooked on the ventilator for life. And she said that that was not acceptable to her. So her answer to the third question was that after a week or so of the ventilator, if she cannot come off, she wants you to stop it and just let her die in peace. She did not want to live on a ventilator. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. She had her surgery, but we could not get her off the ventilator uh, in the, uh, in the time, and actually we gave a little extra time. And then uh, we, were, uh, we, were, we stopped the treatments and the ventilator according to her wishes. And everybody was at peace that the right things were being done for the patient because she had made those, that decision and the family did not have to make that decision. When we had first talked to her, this was done in an ethics committee meeting with the family and all the adult children were there. And when we stopped everything, the adult children were there and they understood and they were at peace that this was the right thing to do. So it goes, goes to show you that having how important and how powerful these conversations can be. Again, a reminder, goals of care are driving the plan of care. So when we are talking to the patients, we are talking about their goals of living, what they want to achieve, what they want to do, not what treatments they want. My answer usually is, we'll give you the treatments to get you to your goals, and if we cannot, then we'll stop all those, except, of course, for those few treatments that they may have mentioned that they do not wish to receive at all. This format that I am, uh, uh, excuse me, the, that I am uh, uh, just talked about, here's an example what the, what the advanced directive or the document may look like after you have this conversation. 
So I had this conversation with this uh, retired Marine who happened to be a family member. And he was in his 90s. He was um, slowly uh, getting worse in terms of his ability to do, do things. And he actually voiced himself. He said, I know I'm dying slowly. And one of these days I'm going to die. Uh, but uh, at, uh, so far he was able to get out of bed and eat and talk and has full capacity, crack jokes and everything. So I sat down with him to talk about his end of life wishes, talked about his minimum acceptable levels of living mentally, physically, and treatments. And as a result of that conversation, this is the document that we formulated. And his wishes said, number one, do not artificially prolong my life if I cannot recognize my family and communicate with them. Number two, you may treat my illness if I'm able to recognize my family and communicate with them, but do not artificially prolong this state by means of dialysis, respirator, or artificial nutrition hydration for more than a week. In other words, he gave us a week. He said, if in a week looks like I'm gonna get better, fine, you can continue to get me back to my levels. Otherwise, that's long enough. Third was that if I'm totally bedridden, and this is important. This is uh, the first time that I've had a patient who, who mentioned this as an important uh, physical ability for him. That if I'm totally bedridden, please do not treat any illness, but keep me comfortable with no artificial treatments for long life. So in other words, what he's saying is, if he gets a pneumonia, uh, he gets sepsis, he gets cellulitis, whatever, don't give him antibiotics, just keep him comfortable because he's already totally bedridden and he doesn't want to live like that anyway. So if the illness was going to take his life, that's his way out. Number four, he said, well, the artificial treatments are only acceptable if I can be rehabilitated to my goals as stated above in number two. So you can see how simple but clear cut the message is as to what kind of life this gentleman wanted to live and what kind of things were not acceptable to him. And number five, he says, I don't want to be a burden. And number six, he wished to die at home. So we formulated this document about three months before he hit his leg that got infected and he got gangrene on his foot and was admitted to the hospital with sepsis and gangrene. And the patient's uh, doctors asked the wife for permission to amputate his leg or foot because uh, without that he would die. So she called me to find out what we should do and we said, my answer was, let's see what he wanted done or not done. And as we did this, it was very clear, he was almost already totally, if you look at number three, almost already totally bed bound and uh, bedridden and uh, with a, with a amputated leg, he would be totally bed, bedridden and go through a lot of pain and suffering of the surgery and all that. And uh, he would uh, not want to live like that. So she made a decision not to have the amputation and actually stopped antibiotics and he died uh, soon after. Now, the important thing I want to point out is that after this, she kept calling me every month for about six months and say, did we do the right thing or did she make the right decision? And every time I had her take the advanced directive out and read it, and then she would be at peace for about a month, that yes, it is the right thing. And then whenever the doubt started to come, she would have to um, you know, talk to me again and read the advanced directive again. So you can see the how powerful and helpful and what a gift this advanced directive and these conversations were for her so that she didn't have to live with that decision in an in a awful manner, okay? All right, so I want to address uh, C, uh, D, uh, CPR and DNR very briefly. And the reason I'm doing this because this is a, in every person, this question comes up. Should I be a DNR or not? DNR means do not resuscitate, and CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So they, 
when I do consults with patients, I always say that, you know, decision on CPR is one of the easiest decisions in with sick patients. Uh, the reason being there are very clear cut criteria when CPR is to be done and when it is not to be done. Patients who have chronically life limiting diseases who are gradually getting worse and where death is expected, as, uh, like for almost all the patients in the hospice uh, arena, um, CPR is not the treatment for those patients. Patients that have multiple organ failure in the hospital, CPR is not the treatment of choice for those patients because they will never leave the hospital. And after CPR, they'll be much worse. Patients that have severe dementia, they're already living a meaningful life, uh, a life that is not very meaningful to them, and they're not even aware of what's going on. CPR is not the treatment. So there are three reasons when you can say that having a do not resuscitate order makes sense. Number one is fertility. By that, I mean that by resuscitating this patient, the doctors feel that there will be no benefit to the patient at all. Either you won't be able to resuscitate them or you won't be able to get them out of the hospital because they're already so sick that they will have another cardiac arrest and die. The second reason is the patient's quality of life is so poor even before the cardiac arrest that they wish they were not alive. And for those patients to try and resuscitate them doesn't make sense. And the third reason is that the quality of life after CPR, right now patient is borderline quality of life, and after CPR would be much worse and patient wouldn't wanna live like that. So there are three clear cut reasons when CPR should not be done and patient should be made a do not resuscitate. Um, this is done with the consultation with the physicians to make sure that the patient is making these decisions based on sound information, okay? Um, I had a personal friend who made this decision, uh, was very proud actually of herself and just happened to mention to me one day when she was visiting us that, oh, you know, I'm a do not resuscitate. And my question to her was, why are you do not resuscitate? And her answer was because CPR does a lot of bad things. So she really did not have all the good information. CPR is a very good treatment in the right patient and CPR and do not resuscitate is the right choice in the, uh, some other patients. So after our conversations uh, she was going to redo her will to make sure that she's resuscitated under certain conditions and not on others. Now this COVID thing that's, that, that happened, the coronavirus, it started making people very nervous and advanced care planning became a huge important part for everyone because people thought, oh my gosh, I can uh, lose my capacity, get very sick, and then people won't know what to do. Should I get resuscitated or not, treated or not? So uh, hopefully the COVID has made us realize how important advanced care planning is. But if you had, had these three questions and had your advanced planning talked about the minimum acceptable levels of life that are acceptable to you that you would say is still meaningful. Uh, you, are, you have done your advanced care planning no matter what you know, happens in the future. Uh, now with the COVID you can think or talk about is that uh, depending upon what kind of uh, physical health you or your patient is in, that if you, what you would decide do with resuscitation, ventilator, et cetera, if you do not have the virus and what you might do if you do have the virus. So there can be a slight difference in the two. Uh, but again, this requires good conversation with your physician. I think your job for yourself and for your patients is at least do the three questions so you have your basic advanced care planning and conversations done. Just a word about dementia. And the reason I say that is because patients, uh, every time I give this talk, and I've been doing this talk at Chautauqua Institute, New York, um, uh, for many years to general public, and actually that's where I'm right now as well. Um, 
somebody always asks about dementia and how they can end their life if they get dementia because nobody wants to live with dementia as they have seen their loved ones uh, go slowly, gradually, their life uh, worsen to a very pitiful state. So I would say talk about dementia and the way I do is it that uh, go on the internet and get out the the fast uh, staging for, for dementia, F-A-S-T, fast stages of dementia. And I give it to the patient or the person who's advanced care planning and say, see what stage, what condition you would say, as long as I can do this is still okay, but the next stage, I wouldn't want to live like that with dementia. And then those patients, when they reach close to that stage, should be made do not resuscitate. Um, now, there, there are three ways a person can end, a person's life can be ended uh, legally, okay? The states where they have uh, uh, physician-assisted uh, uh, suicide um, legal, or they call it aid in dying, over there, patient can request it themselves, but they have to have capacity to do that. The second reason one can end life quickly is to voluntarily stop eating and drinking. Again, you have to have the capacity and say voluntarily, I'm gonna stop eating and drinking. But a lot of people in near the end of life do not have that. People, of course, with dementia do not. But now people, uh, many states are starting to accept an advanced directive that says that if I have dementia and I reach this stage, please do not offer me food and water. So this is uh, the newest thing that's coming up to help people make decisions for themselves ahead of time. So there's the, another way one can, um, uh, one can end life quickly is to stop artificially life prolonging treatments if the patient is not at a level that they would want to be. So if, the, if you have this advanced care planning uh, conversation and patient says, once, uh, I'll give you an example. I had a lady uh, in the hospital who was on uh, uh, life support, of, uh, minimal life support, but was on dialysis, uh, but she could had capacity and could talk. So my conversation, she said, once I cannot recognize my daughter and converse with her, then I want everything stopped, and you can stop the dialysis. So a week later, uh, she was at that stage, and in good conscience, everybody could, including the daughter, uh, could accept stopping the dialysis and letting the mother die in peace. So that's another legal way one can end life early is to stop life-prolonging treatments, artificial life-prolonging treatments, when they're of no benefit to the patient. And last but not least is if the, if the patient is suffering a lot from symptoms, uh, we can sedate them uh, to a point where they're totally sedated and unaware of what's going on. And then over time, they will, of course, die. But uh, at least they're not suffering. Again, ethically, legally, medically, and legally, that is all acceptable. Just a... Uh, Another part of advanced care planning, just a reminder, there's such a thing as organ donation, which is very helpful to uh, patients uh, or to other families where they may be needed. So always talk to them to see if they are willing to donate. Uh, all right, so documents. So after you have this discussion, the document I just showed you about the, about, uh, the, the marine uh, is the one that uh, can be made so you can write in your own words. Uh, you can sign it, have two volunteer uh, witnesses, and that's a legal document. In the state of Maryland, even a notary public, uh, you don't need to notarize your signature in Maryland. In other states, you may have to, and it, it, uh, this document does not have been made by a lawyer. You, he, they can, but it is not a must. You or you can do the five wishes um, a document, or you have the state-owned advanced directives. 
the state advanced directives really talk about three conditions. Uh, so the whole advanced directive of uh, minimum levels and what is important to you is, is a lot more than that. So what I did myself was I had done the state advanced directives and once I started talking about the three wishes, I just added it to that. And my wife has done the five wishes and added the, the three questions to that. Um, so there are many different ways to have these documents. Once you have the document, you need to give copies to friends, family, your physician, the hospital, the lawyer, make sure everybody uh, knows about it. And carry a wallet, a card uh, indicating you have advanced directions and who to call in case uh, uh, there's a need. Uh, when you go to a hospital, please take the, the document with you. Uh, the, the, the physical document. I believe in the hard copy more than the internet uh, copies uh, because they are some very hard to find. If you are very internet savvy and you don't like hard copies, you can go to what is called mydirectives.com and you can make your advanced directive online also. And in Maryland, CRISP, uh, it, really, it can be on CRISP. And, uh, but finding it is the, is the problem. In the hospital, patients have told me, oh, we brought our advanced directive, they have it in the chart, but uh, half the time we can't find it. So carry the hard copy. Just a word about what MOLST is. It stands for Maryland Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatments. And uh, the MOLST is a physician order. It is not an advanced directive, but these orders are written after conversation with patient or families as to how to manage the patient in the future. So uh, do not resuscitate order can be on the MOLS form and what kind of a treatments you may want or not want can also be on the MOLS form. But this is a physician order and it has to be filled out by physician. In, in the state of Maryland, a physician, nurse practitioner or physician assistant actually can fill these. Here's just a few helpful phrases. Uh, I don't know, you want me to go through those, uh, Beza, or should we open up to questions? Do you have a lot of questions? Um, we don't have any questions as of now, but um, you can go through them, definitely. And then we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes to, to okay. engage with, with our audience. All right, so uh, the few helpful phrases for, for the, that you can use with the patients. And a lot of these things uh, I, I, I like. So these are the I messages. I can see this is not what you were hoping for. I wish I had better news for you. I can only imagine how this feels to you. I appreciate that you do or don't want to know what to expect. I am worried how this might end. I wish I had something better. I wish I could do a miracle. I don't know what to say, but I'm here to help you through whatever. And what are you, ask the patient as to what they're hoping for now. And if the patient's hopes and wishes are not attainable or unrational uh, or unreasonable, then you need to be upfront and open and say, I don't think we can achieve this. And if we cannot, what would be your next goal? Okay, so what the goals to be achieved then. Um, the way, this way I said, I can only imagine how this feels for you. Oh, I'm trying to empathize with the patient. So there's this gap between us and the patient and the families of this, of this trust and a, and, and, a, and a bond and a binding. So two ways that you can get closer to them. One is by listening to what they have to say. Most of the time I'll say, just tell me a story about your dad. Tell me about your dad so I know him better, so I can help him better. And then just listen to what they have to say. And the second is to empathize with them, to tell them that you understand that this must be very difficult for them. Uh, you don't know how they feel, but you can see how, let's say, uh, 50 years of losing your partner after 50 years of marriage is one of the hardest things one can do. So you need to start empathizing with them so that they can, uh, you can get closer and bridge that gap. Just a word about we want everything done. 
at, is an incomplete sentence. So the question is really everything done to achieve what? What goals are to be realized? So my answer to why we want everything done is that everything that is of benefit to the patient has been done, is being done, and will be done. The things that are of not benefit, those are the things that we have to stop. Either not give or stop because they're not causing any benefit, bringing any benefit to the patient. So, um, and, and of course, miracle, is that's the other common word of you waiting. We believe in miracles. And I say, yes, that's great. I believe in miracles too. So let's hold our hand together. And I pray with them. I say, let's pray for a miracle. But in the meantime, let's get ready in case the miracle doesn't happen. Then how are we going to manage the patient if the miracle doesn't happen? So let's talk about that. So we, we don't take away their hope of miracle, but we go. Talking about hope, I, I, uh, I uh, talk about uh, uh, what we call realistic hope. And I have a great story, but I don't have time. We'll have to talk about it another time, okay? Um, well, maybe I'll give you that quick story. So this is a good one. Um, so the hope changes from, from uh, uh, cure to, okay, the cure is not going to happen uh, a long life. Let's see how long we can keep the patient uh, alive. Okay, if that is getting short, uh, then uh, some few turn it till uh, graduation or something like that. And if that is not going to happen, let's see if we can, okay, uh, have no suffering, no pain, and take care of all that. If this is not going to happen, at least we have a peaceful end and that the patient dies peacefully. So there's a story of a 16-year-old girl dying of uh, brain cancer, and her father and mother, of course, quite bereft with uh, seeing her go downhill, uh, and uh, they have already given up on the hope of cure uh, and, uh, and longevity, and all they wanted was uh, her to be comfortable now. And then one day when I went to see them in the home, the father sat down with me and said, Doc, you know, yesterday, I lay down with my daughter and her eyes were open for a while. And I just looked into her eyes for about 45 minutes. And that was the best day of my life. And all I'm hoping now is for one more day like that. I know she's going to die, but I just want one more day like that. So the whole hope thing is, so he was getting down to the realistic hope and you can see that his hope was not that she doesn't die, but that he gets to spend another hour looking in her eyes. Okay, uh, with that, I think we are down to useful resources. Yep. Okay, so uh, I want to thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, I'm with everybody else. Uh, I much rather we were doing this in person. So we could talk a lot more. And this way, of course, the time becomes a, also a big factor. And I'm sorry not to have made a whole lot of better connection with you all, but I hope I reached some of you somewhere. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz. As always, this was brilliant. Um, we have about six minutes. Now is your, your time to ask Dr. Aziz any questions you might have. Really, um, if you'd like to ask him live, you can just go ahead and raise your hand and we can um, unmute your audio so that you can ask him live. So I'll give you a few minutes. If you don't have a question, just say I don't have a question and type it in the chat box and we'll move on. Oh, um, and I know most of you were not able to participate in the poll. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is actually open that poll up um, so you can all have the opportunity to answer that question that we asked earlier. Yeah, we can talk. Uh... Um, and I think that's a very important question, so knowing how, how many people have their uh, advanced directives. If not, also, if, if you've had the conversation, um, that's also a great start. So. 
We would love to know that. I yeah. am going to be opening Thank it up you. right yeah. now. You should see that poll. Um, you have about. Actually, of the two, having the conversation is a, probably a more important thing because many times uh, and patients have had a conversation but no written document. Mm -hmm. and we can help, uh, can help the family a lot make decisions depending upon that conversation. So, uh, so at least have the conversation if you're not fully up to <laughs> up to snuff yet to yes. writing. But it's uh, like I said, it can be changed anytime. So don't be afraid. And and I'll say again, if anybody wants to call and talk to me about any of this, uh, you're welcome. You want to write to me, you're welcome. So we have 15 people who said um, who answered yes to having it an advanced directive, and 15 people said no. So um, we're still waiting for have, have 36 any, people okay. to so respond. The directive is good, but many times people have an advanced directive but haven't really talked to the families. They and I, that so. would be the second question. Well, we're gonna once this question is this poll is closed, I would have that that one open. Second, I'll give you 30 seconds to reply to this this poll. So, so, so you can see we have work to do ourselves before mm -hmm. talking to the patients. And actually in the hospitals, we are doing this, uh, we're having all the residents do there, they're having the CEO and the, and the, you know, the, the higher up administrative folks do this because we need to see how it feels, what emotions you have to go through to think about this uh, before we can help the patients do a good one. Absolutely. All right. Um, so the, closing this poll, we have 27 people who have not responded to it yet, but we have 22 people who said yes and 18, 18 said no. So 50-50. Almost 50-50, almost yeah, yeah, which is as expected. <laughs> in my experience in, in the hospital, so the patient in the hospital, only about 30% have either had a conversation or have an advanced directive. So maybe overall as society, we're getting a little bit better. Absolutely. We've got a long way to go, yeah. Well, after today's talk, we're gonna be almost 100%, right? Hopefully. Well, I'm well, opening up. To do it, right? <laughs> I'm opening up the second poll question. Have you had the conversation? Um, and this one should be interesting. Yeah, let's see. Wow, more people have had the conversation. You're you're definitely well, right on, on ball well, on that one. Excellent. Excellent. So um, 35 people said yes to having the conversation and eight people said no. Ah, and that's right. a significant difference between having a, a directive versus right. having a conversation, which, as you've said, is um, crucial. Right, right. Okay. Um, we have Gwen who says in the comments, I have had the conversation, but I haven't written it down. I'll, um, I'll get to it soon. That's good. We want, um, you know, moving towards an action. Um, not necessarily, you know, if you don't, if you've had, had, haven't had the conversation yet, hopefully you would initiate and have it with your loved ones or you know, with patients and families. Well, I, I, um, can, I can quickly give you a story of the why having the, we're having a conversation helped in the decision making. So we had a lady in her late 60s who has had dementia, moderate dementia. Uh, she could talk a little, uh, she was mostly bed bound, but could get up and walk some uh, she could tell you she was cold or hot or hungry, uh, but couldn't really do much more than that. Um, and then um, she has said, same thing happened. She her, her leg got hurt. She got gangrene on her foot. And the doctors wanted to amputate the foot to save her life. So they asked the family and they asked me for to do a palliative care consult because there was no advanced directive. In asking the family if they had had conversations, one of the sons 
said, I remember mom saying that I never wanted to lie in a bed of affliction. So which was a beautifully said, and actually I got the permission to use that quote in my book also. So I said, okay, so on the basis of that, maybe you guys can go home and talk to everyone and see what, um, whether we can come up with the decision. And I gave them the pros and cons of, uh, of the uh, cutting the leg off versus uh, just doing comfort care for her. And um, so they came back next day and they said, yes. They said, you know, we decided not to have the amputation because with the amputation, she's already lying in a bed of affliction. With the bed of amputation, she'll be totally lying in a bed of affliction. She did not want that. So we want to take her home under hospice, let her enjoy the whatever days and weeks she has with her family. And uh, we are all okay and good with that. So you can see how the little conversation that they remembered, uh, uh, were, and I think I thought they were making absolutely the right decision. And uh, everybody was able to support that. And they could make that decision just on the conversation without a written advance directive. So it goes to show you the importance of the conversation. Now you hope that people will remember that conversation. So the written document is because one may not remember everything uh, all the time. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz. Before, I, I, I do have a question that I, I just missed from Leslie. Um, who decides, let's see, she asks, give me a second, I think I know. Yeah, she asked, you mentioned quality of life and meaningful life. Who decides this? Well, that, that's, where the, uh, that's where the conversation with the patients, uh, the three questions come in handy. I think she's asking maybe, if you have not had those conversations, who decides the quality of life? Then the family, with the help of the family, you would have to talk about, uh, and my, uh, uh, if there'd be no conversation, then you cannot say, oh, this is what the patient would have wanted. Uh, this is what we know for sure. Uh, then you have to go to what one would have wanted. Like what you, you and I, I call it the gold standard. So if it was you, would you say this is a good life for you? And if you don't think this is a good life for you, then it's probably is not a good life for your loved one either. So that's the best that you can do in those kind of instances. And also you have to look at the how much you know uh, positive and how much negative you're going to come get from the treatments or continuing those treatments. So it's a family meeting with the uh, doctors and together coming up with what you feel, what everybody can support as doing the right thing. And if there's a lot of confusion, you can even call the ethics committee of the hospital to help you with that. And I've done multiple of those also. So uh, this is not a one person decision, it's a, it's a joint decision. Thank you so much. Um, I see more questions are coming, but I, um, I wanna be, respectful of Dr. Aziz's time and also our next presenter. We'll um, leave out some time at the, at the very end to address um, these questions that are coming up right now. Um, Dr. Aziz, I thank you for your time. As always, this is wonderful, terrific. Um, I, would, I wanna mention that we are gonna share, I've been getting these, this question privately. I am, we are gonna share all resources, uh, including the PowerPoint shared today and the follow-up. Um, right now, my, my colleague Magna is sharing a link to an evaluation form. So if you, um, attend, if you are attending just this session, um, we ask you complete the um, evaluation form before you um, leave. So thank you so much, Dr. Aziz. And now thank I'm gonna you. go ahead and introduce- Want me to come back at the end of the next session for the questions? That would be wonderful if you have the time. If, um, if not, I can send you these questions and you can, uh, respond to them and, and send. I, we can send it to each individual person. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll probably come back if I can, okay. Wonderful. All right, thank you. Great. So um, this next session is going to be about the last lab approaching the end. So we're gonna talk about signs and symptoms 
of dying and we have Sally Roberts here with us. Sally, can you hear me? If so, tell me you can. <laughs> I can. Okay, wonderful. Hi, Sally. Um, so Sally Roberts is one of our hospice liaisons, uh, hospital nurse liaisons here at Montgomery and Prince George's Hospice. She um, has been with us for almost nine years right now, or is it 10? <laughs> oh, we can't hear you, Sally. Can you hear me? Now? Yes, wonderful. Yeah, it was 10 years in May. Yes. Um, so you've been, she's been here with us for a long time here at Montgomery Hustle. She's worn different hats, including um, she started as a clinical manager. She's been um, also a, a primary nurse and now serves as a hospital nurse liaison. Um, prior to coming to Montgomery Hospice, she's worked at the Kansas City um, Hospice and Palliative Care, where she served as a team manager as well as community liaison. She's worked at Ka um, Kaiser Permanente as a team manager. Um, and then here right now, currently as a um, hospital liaison, her role is primary role really is to to serve as a resource and an educator um, for discharge planners, case managers, nurses, and physicians, and family and patients in the hospitals. She um, often ends up facilitating conversations between um, potential patients and families and physicians. So she really is um, the resource that we have in the hospital setting. Um, so she, for the past few years, she's also been an educator for the Center for Learning. So we really are um, fortunate to have her here um, at the Center for Learning as an educator as well. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let her take it from here. Sally, thank you so much for your time. Um, and you can just keep taking it. You're still muted. OK. OK, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay. All right. Thanks, Faisa. Thank you very much. Um, so this morning, this afternoon now, we're going to talk about uh, the signs and symptoms at end of life. Not a light conversation, but I think it can be extremely helpful to have some idea when you're talking with patients and families and when um, you're observing situations. Uh, what is normal? at that time. So those are the things that we're going to talk about this morning. And if at any point you have a question, just you know, raise your hand, uh, Faisa can let me know. Uh, I do want to start, um, there's a kind of favorite quote that I have that um, just has always been very important to me. And it's a Wilkie quote. And it says that there are two gifts that are passed on. And most of the time, those gifts are passed on unopened, love and death. And um, I think it's helpful to uh, think in terms of death, uh, having the possibility of being a gift, um, because for those of us who have the privilege of being with patients and families at the end of life, uh, we do realize that there are many um, possibilities for, for this to be a gift. So I just wanted to start with that. So we're going to actually um, talk about the dying process, identify common signs and symptoms at end of life, how to recognize that, um, and how to educate family um, and patients. Now, I want to say at the outset, that these are all things that may happen. There are times when the change is so swift and dramatic that many of these stages, uh, we don't see that. Um, so I want to acknowledge that, that this is not what every single person goes through. And it isn't in the, in the stage that every person goes through. But Oftentimes, people will say, well, why do you think they're dying? What is it that, that makes you think that? And so these are some of the symptoms, some of the signs and symptoms that are not uncommon. 
as someone um, approaches end of life. So let's see here. All right. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to advance? Yes. Um, so you can just click on the slide, your slide, the four squares that you see on the left side of your screen. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Faisa. <laughs> okay. Um, so up, down. Yeah. Okay. So um, make sure you uh, make sure you go down to your slides. Okay. All right. So our objectives there, uh, understanding the importance of having these conversations. You know, That's Dr. Aziza. So oh. make sure you go down to your slides. <laughs> <laughs> so just scroll down. Thank you for bearing with us. We're just trying to. Okay. Let's see here. There we go. There okay. we go. Better, more familiar. <laughs> um, so yes, the understanding of the dying process, common signs and symptoms, how to recognize and identify ways to um, educate families um, and, and patients themselves about the, the dying process. So I think it's important to kind of start off with, with this um, information that um, that how well do physicians typically predict the length of time patients have? And um, so just out of curiosity, do you think it's accurately, it's an overestimate, it's an underestimate? Um, and I think that uh, what we find is, um, not a big surprise, but there's it's often an overestimate. Uh, there's statistics to show this. There's a there was a journal in palliative medicine in 2016 um, where they talked about how many people would want to know their prognosis, um, and and the response was 71 percent wanted to know, and how many had the actual conversation. 18%. Um, so we have that discrepancy there that um, when people are asked, yes, they want to know, but do those conversations take place um, infrequently? Now, listening to Dr. Aziz, I think there's you know a lot more emphasis on having those conversations, but I think also the understanding that it is extremely difficult, extremely difficult to, to give an idea of how long someone has. And there's a, a tremendous concern that if you give this information and it's inaccurate, that the trust is somehow shaken. So there's a reluctance to, to have those conversations. Um, but is there any advantage? You know, when someone wants to know how much time is left, why do we even need to tell them that? Um, a lot of people worry that if we do have that conversation, that it will take away hope, that people will die sooner because they've gotten this information. Uh, and the, the reality that, that I see in the 20 plus years that, that I've been in this field is um, that isn't often the case. That uh, when we uh, are able to provide this information to patients and families, as long as it's presented in a, in a compassionate, gentle way, um, it's a relief uh, often very often the patient has a good sense of this. And very often there are decisions that patients or families want to make. And if they don't have that information, it actually can be a disservice. Um, I met with a family uh, just a few months ago, well, before the virus situation. And um, the patient was 
really approaching end of life, probably had days or weeks. And um, the, uh, they were, all the children were dispersed in many parts of the country and some out of the country. And so the question I had for the patient's wife is how important is it for the family members to see their father before he dies? And she was very clear, no hesitation at all. Oh, they would absolutely want to do that. So I asked of the three adult children, particularly the one out of the country, when, when is the next scheduled visit? Well, it was two months away. Um, and so at that point, and I always explain, I am not the physician, I am, you know, but it seems to me of the things that you're describing that are most important at this time, if having a final visit is most important, then I would put that plan in place to make that happen now. And if the visit takes place and the person lives longer that, than anticipated, that's a gift. There's no, there's no downside to that. But if it's been real, if, if it is really important to the family member and to the patient and it doesn't take place, it can be a regret. So I think there are advantages um, to, to giving the information, giving the patient this information. Uh, does it take away hope? I think it can be a disappointment. I think it can be very difficult to hear. And it may, in fact, have an effect on what this person hopes for, what the future might look like. But I think it also gives them the opportunity to now look honestly at that time that may be ahead of them. I'll never forget, there was a man I met, this was years ago, and it, it just is always so fresh in my mind, um, because I was talking to him about hospice, and, um, and he said, well, I'm not really that worried about um, having a terminal situation. And he told me a story about his daughter, who had been um, diagnosed with very advanced cancer, and um, was given a very short prognosis. And she lived six years after that. And so he said, if I have six more years, I have lots of time. And so I asked, if you don't have six years, is there anything, are there choices you would make if you felt you had less time than the choices you would make if you felt you had five or six years? And big smile on his face and he said, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And he had, he um, was a woodworker and he used to make, um, he had a wood shop in his basement. And he said, if I thought I only had a year to live, that's where I would spend my time. I would be down there, I would be making things for friends and family. Um, and so I had an opportunity, I ran into the doctor outside the room and said, you know, I think given um, an experience he had with a, with a family member, his expectation of his, how much time he has may be um, maybe not accurate. Uh, and so the physician was able to have that conversation with him and be a little more honest. And, and, and then the choices he made were based on a little more um, reality. So, um, so I don't think that it necessarily takes away hope. That, that isn't what we often see. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, um, and this is a quote from Dame Cicely Saunders, and, and Cicely Saunders, many of you uh, probably know, was the founder of the hospice movement in the UK in the 60s. Um, and uh, she, I always feel like I need to be sure that people know about Cecilia Saunders. She was originally trained as a nurse, back to school, um, and got her degree in social work. And then she went back and got her medical degree. Um, and at the time, in the 60s, what she identified was the way we take care of people at the end of their life was um, probably at best negligence that um, 
if we felt we couldn't solve the problem, if we couldn't reverse the outcome, then we people were at the end of the hall in the hospitals um, with with minimal contact. And she felt so strongly that we can do better than that. And she felt very strongly also because of her background that it shouldn't just be left up to the physician or the nurse or the social worker, that it should be a team of people. Um, and what she said was how people die remains in the memories of those who live on. And one of the first physicians I worked with in end of life care never forgot that. She would always remind us that we're doing this, we're trying to gentle this journey for those who are in that dying process and their families, because they are also going through this and often don't know what to expect. Um, so the, the aim of hospice is to normalize the dying process, that this is something all of us will go through at some point, and there are things that are common, um, anticipated and normal as someone approaches end of life. So what are some of those things and how do we, uh, how do we identify these periods at end of life? Because often um, when, when we talk about someone dying, uh, what, when, if someone says to me, that, that this person is dying, I have an idea in my head what that means. And we all do, we all have an idea of what we mean when we hear that term that someone, someone is dying. Um, and it may be that that just means that their illness is not curable and maybe they only have a few years to live. Um, oftentimes when someone hears that someone is dying, they they think in terms of someone drawing their final breath. And so that they're unresponsive, um, that they can't interact, uh, but there's a lot of in between there. And so sometimes it's helpful for those of us involved with people at end of life to have some idea of what do we mean by this when we talk about um, end of life or dying. So if those of us in end of life care, we, we talk about these, these phases, and, and the one phase is this pre-active phase of dying. Um, and so what do we expect at that point? And again, keep in mind that this is not necessarily, um, th there's no uh, assurance that someone is gonna go through these stages um, in this particular order, but these are, some things we may see uh, in individuals as they um, approach or enter these stages. So this pre-active phase of dying, you may see some, some increased restlessness, confusion, agitation. Now I wanna say here, this is different than terminal agitation. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And that's a unique set of um, symptoms uh, that can be extremely difficult to manage. Um, so we're not talking about terminal agitation here. This is um, a period where um, just some restlessness, confusion, agitation that wasn't there before isn't related to um, like what's going on in the brain. Um, and it's it's that inability to stay content in one position, um, just fidgeting a lot. Maybe they're even ambulatory and they're getting up or moving in bed a lot. It can be very, very difficult on the family and the caregivers uh, because they're constantly trying to calm this person down. Um, they also may be picking at the sheets. A lot of times you'll see that where they it seems like they they see something there and they're trying to pick that up um, or uh, readjusting the the um, sheets or their clothes. Um, decreased intake of food and fluids. Um, you know, there's an interesting uh, chart uh, that talks about 
you know, we're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Well, there's actually a chart that's called the hierarchy of the dying person's needs. And um, it's, it's uh, enlightening because um, this uh, desire for food and fluids, that's ingrained in us, that if someone doesn't eat and drink, they can't get stronger. They can't get stronger, they're not going to get well. And so this um, phase that, that someone enters where they, they just don't want to eat and drink, maybe they actually have some dysphagia. Maybe they recognize that they're coughing a lot after they do take food and fluids. Um, and so it's kind of their body's way of, of not having a complication. Uh, it may be that that food doesn't taste right any longer, but it's that sense, like if we have the flu and um, it doesn't matter who brings us our most favorite food, our body is saying, mm -mm, not now, that's not the priority. Well, as someone's body begins to shut down, that desire for food and fluids is not the priority that it is for a healthy body. Um, and the body doesn't need the energy, the food, as it did previously. The other thing is that it takes energy to convert food to fuel. And many times the energy that that person is using is to keep their heart beating, to keep them breathing, to keep their blood circulating, and food and fluids are not the priority. Um, and, and again, that's on that uh, hierarchy of the dying person genes. It does not have, it's not the most important thing at that point. Keeping their mouth moist, absolutely. Even if they have IV fluids running in the hospital, their mouth is still dry. So doing real good mouth care is essential. That is a true comfort measure that's often ignored. Uh, easily fatigued, muscle weakening, um, the energy that it may take just to, again, if they have been ambulatory, maybe to try to get up and go into the bathroom is exhausting. And so the question is, how important is it to have that person exercise, to get up, to get into the chair? If getting into the chair, they're exhausted and can't interact with anybody once that happens. So it's constantly reevaluating what's the most important thing, what's the most beneficial thing that this person is doing at this point. Um, we may also see things um, as significant as the as apnea, as changes in their breathing, um, where you may be watching someone breathe and all of a sudden it, it, it seems like they're not breathing. At all, and then the breathing begins again. So those are that changes. Um, those changes in breathing is something that um, would indicate that they may be entering that that preactive um, phase. Uh, decreased attention span. You know, this is something that um, somebody can be pretty seriously ill and unaware of their illness, and uh, and they talk about you know wanting. Um, wanting friends to be there or wanting their children or their grandchildren to come and visit. But then you begin to notice that um, family members may say, well, the grandkids are coming over today. And the person may say, you know what, tomorrow might be a better day. Um, or they'll say, you know, your friend is here at the beginning of the week. You'd like to stop by again today. And, and the person um, just doesn't have the energy uh, to, to do that. Uh, often it's that, um, again, it takes energy to interact. And oftentimes I'll talk with families and they'll say, my dad or my mom is so social. They love having people around. And they can't understand why they're saying, don't come visit. Um, and oftentimes for someone who has been so social and enjoys that interaction, it's hard to get out of that role of 
of engaging and interacting and entertaining. And so it may just be too exhausting to have people um, visit. Uh, and, and so that world begins to narrow. Um, and I'll often tell people to not take anything personally. Maybe there are five adult children and they've been taking their time, you know, so-and-so comes in the morning, this one in the afternoon, and dad or mom is now saying, you know, let's just, let, we, we don't need to keep doing that. Um, these are different circumstances. This is a whole different normal right now. And so it's not uncommon for people to not have the ability to have that attention span and to have their, um, their world narrower. Um, people may spend uh, an increasing amount of time sleeping. A lot of times people, when, I, when I'm talking with people and asking them what the circumstances are now, they'll say, you know, it almost seems like they're sleeping more than they're awake. They are. It's a very, very common um, sign that you see as someone is approaching in this life. And oftentimes when I'm talking to someone and we describe this symptom that they're sleeping more than they're awake, the family will say, oh my goodness, yes, that's what I've noticed that. It seems like they're awake very little any longer. Um, and again, that social withdrawal from people, um, declining the visits from family and friends. The other thing is that, that we may see at this point is um, that, uh, um, life review, wanting to uh, get things in order, get their paperwork in order, um, and just kind of talk about uh, how they view what their life has been. They may want to talk about regrets that they have. Um, and, and if someone is able to have those conversations, it really, really is a gift to be the one present um, at that time. Um, uh, one other thing I want to say is um, with this life review and, and getting affairs in order um, and the fact that they may suffer maybe sleeping a lot more and decreased interaction. We never want to minimize uh, how valuable being present can be. Oftentimes families will say, I'm not doing anything. You know, they, they can't eat, so I, I can't feed them. You know, they're having difficulty swallowing, so I, I can't even, you know, give them something to drink. There's nothing I can do. Being present may be one of the biggest gifts and most important things that we can offer someone as they approach end of life. We don't have to be feeding them. We don't have to be um, listening to them. If they're unable to have conversations, being present, maybe just holding their hand, maybe reading to them, praying, playing music, these are all things that can be extremely comforting to someone as they approach end of life. Um, and they may, if they are still alert enough, request um, visits or from family members or friends uh, to settle that, that unfinished business. And that, again, is um, a gift that someone can have if they are aware that end of life is approaching. So when we were talking about, you know, does this take away hope or what what is the value in someone knowing, this is this is a big point that um, someone may feel very strongly about wanting to have a conversation, um, wanting to tie up these ends, and if they're aware that their time may be limited, they have that opportunity to do that. Uh, some of the other physical signs that we see may be swelling, edema um, in the extremities or the entire body. Um, 
and people will say that, you know, that never happened before. We're not quite sure what's going on there. Um, we see it at times when someone's in the hospital setting and they're getting maybe just IV fluids or perhaps they're getting um, TPN, uh, uh, artificial nutrition. Um, and because their body isn't able to use the fluids the way a healthy body would. And so you begin to see the um, fluid accumulating in hands and feet, lower extremities, you hear your chest congestion due to the um, inability to use the fluids the way a healthy body would. Um, inability to heal and recover from wounds. You know, if someone, maybe they have a surgical site or um, maybe they had skin breakdown and uh, that it just seems to be getting worse despite all the interventions. Um, they're not eating normally. Uh, that's going to compromise things. Um, but oftentimes people will describe that. You know, they, they had this small wound and it just keeps getting worse. Um, it's not healing at all. These are things that we can see. Um, this uh, patient's talking about seeing people. Um, that can be so real to the individual. Um, and they may ask you do, you, do you see this person? I see this person. Um, that's a difficult question to respond to because we don't want to upset them if we say, well, I don't see anything. Um, because they may worry, why am I seeing this? Sometimes a helpful response is if they say they're seeing their mother who died 20 years ago, is it a comfort to you? Does that make you feel peaceful? Um, we don't need to argue um, and we don't need to try to, to um, prove that the person's not there. What's the significance to them? Does it provide comfort? Often it does. Um, the symbolic language, going home. Um, a lot of times people talk about um, getting on the train, um, taking my rest. Uh, so um, now I'll tell you a story. When, uh, when my mom was uh, um, dying, um, we had family members there. My sisters were there. My nieces were there. And each person wanted to spend some time with her. And so my niece was, was talking to my mom. I was in the other room. And um, it was really, really a, a lovely conversation, um, very meaningful. And, and at one point, my mom said to my niece, um, I need to go. And my niece turned around to me and, you know, kind of shrugged her shoulders and had this panic look in her face. Um, and so she talked to my mom a little bit more. Um, as it turns out, my mom had to go to the bathroom. Um, so so we, it's okay to ask, um, what do you mean by that? Uh, because if it is, in fact, that they just need to go to the bathroom, we want to respond to that. Whereas my poor niece uh, was getting into this um, philosophical conversation with my mom, <laughs> and that wasn't at all what she was talking about. So sometimes to clarify what someone needs uh, is helpful too. Oftentimes, if someone um, speaks several languages, you may see and hear that they revert to their primary language. Um, so that can be helpful to have someone else who's able to speak that language and translate for them. Um, let's see. Um, Pain concerns. This is often a very, very real concern that someone has. Um, oftentimes, people are reluctant to take medication because they worry if I take it now, there won't be anything strong enough if the pain increases. We need patients and families to know that most of the time, the majority of the time, we are going to be able to control the pain. Um, 
We can use liquid concentrated medications if they can't swallow. We can use pain patches. We can use uh, PCA uh, infusions. Um, so people need to be reassured that their symptoms, we can manage their symptoms. Um, and we need to know if that is a concern. We also need to know, sometimes people will say, if they're still alert, I'll put up with the pain if I can interact with my family. So it's, it's not our decision to make. We need to know what the patient's goals are, what's important to them at that point. Uh, and so the, the next phase um, that we get into, we, we actually call, a lot of times people would say they're actively dying. What does that mean, that they're actively dying? And this may, in fact, be when they're non-responsive. Um, comatose, um, that they can only respond um, to uh, stimuli. Um, they may not respond at all to conversation, um, to any kind of noise. Um, this point, you can sometimes see what we call um, uh, terminal agitation. That's what I was talking about earlier. This can be a very difficult symptom to manage. It may be uh, a situation where someone has not eaten in days, they haven't had anything to drink, they've been minimally responsive, and that person now seems to have the strength of a 20-year-old. They're trying to climb out of bed, they're swinging their legs over the side rails of the hospital bed, they're pulling themselves up, um, What's going on at this point? It's hard to say. It may be metabolic. Um, it, it may be pain. The bottom line is we need to address that. We need families to know if you're at home and you're seeing this and this person has not slept all night because those are the kind of symptoms that, that you're seeing, call hospice. This is um, not a situation that you want to escalate. Uh, they may need increases in their medications. They may need additional medications. Um, it's extremely difficult for families to manage these situations, but it, it usually is manageable even at home. But it has to be identified as a change in the condition, something that we, we can do something about. Um, also, this is the time when we may see changes in breathing patterns. Um, the, the breathing pattern that we talk of, uh, chain Stokes respirations. So uh, breathing at end of life um, usually is a, still a normal breathing pattern. It may be faster, it may be slower, but it may be regular. With this apnea or chain Stokes respirations, what we see is periods of no breathing that can be 10 to 60 seconds. And we, it almost seems like the person has died. And then you see them take a deep breath again and the breathing begins. This, is, this can be in the final hours to days of life, um, but that is significant, it is something you may notice some changes in skin color and temperature when that happens as well. Um, this uh, chest congestion um, is often referred to as a death rattle. Um, actually sounds worse than it is. It is congestion, it's audible, you can hear it. Um, and often what it is um, are secretions in the back of the throat that um, if the person was strong enough to cough, they would. If they were moving around, those secretions would kind of clear themselves. But because they're so weak, they may be lying on their back, those secretions just sit there, and it, it sounds frightening. It sounds like they're really struggling. So we often suggest a couple of things. The first thing, reposition. Turn the person on their side. Oftentimes, that will relieve that. Um, we will use medications to help dry up excess secretions. We want to avoid suctioning. Um, suctioning will often increase secretions. Um, it's really annoying to the individual. 
if they're able to communicate, they'll tell you, it. stop it, it hurts. Um, so the repositioning and use of medications um, often works best. And again, um, if they've been receiving fluids, now would be the time to stop because if we're hearing that increased congestion, the fluids are just adding to that. Um, agonal breathing, sometimes called stuffy breathing, uh, you, you actually see the use of the accessory muscles. So um, oftentimes people will say, I think they're struggling to breathe. And what, what I explain is their breathing pattern may be irregular. And they may be having these periods of uh, apnea where they're not breathing. But struggling to breathe is when they actually are using the accessory muscles. When these muscles in here in their chest, in the upper part of their chest, um, when, you, when you see those their body leaning forward in an attempt to take a deeper breath, that is struggling to breathe. We want to use a small dose of morphine at that point to relieve that work of breathing. But irregular breathing and, and this guppy breathing where their mouth kind of puffs out and, and you know, expels the air, um, it isn't struggling to breathe, but it is a change in breathing pattern. Uh, this inability to swallow um, is, is something that, that we really want to pay attention to because our instinct is to, to try to keep giving someone water, um, especially if we know they're not eating and drinking. So we hold their head up and we take that glass and we pour a little in there. When someone is, is in that final stage, when, they're, when they are actively dying, um, it's not that they can't swallow, it's they can't control the swallowing. And so that liquid will go down, but it will likely go into the trachea and, and lungs rather than the esophagus and stomach. That's, then, that's when people start coughing um, and, and because they've aspirated. So what we don't want to do is cause problems at that point. So we want to avoid um, having them drink something, again, because they don't have that, it will go down, it will go down. Um, but they don't have the ability to close off that area and keep it from going into the, into the lung. Um, real good mouth care is extremely important, extremely important. Just take a swab um, and, uh, and clear the secretions in the mouth. It will also moisten their tongue and their lips. Um, again, artificial nutrition and hydration at this point uh, will cause discomfort likely because their body can't. When we talk about the use of IV fluids as helpful, we're talking about a healthy body. We put that fluid in their veins, their body establishes equilibrium, they, it's used, it, everything's back in balance. In a body that's starting to shut down, that's not what's happened. And what happens is instead of the fluid going into the veins, being absorbed, it's now going into the tissues and that's where you see that um, accumulate, that swelling in the hands and the feet and congestion. Uh, oftentimes, even tube feedings, um, we'll get to the point where um, they may cause problems as well. Um, to, when someone has a feeding tube placed, it will minimize the risk of aspiration from the mouth down. It does not eliminate the risk of aspiration from the stomach up. And so it doesn't solve all the problems that we hope it will. And, it, and if their body is not able to absorb all the artificial nutrition, it makes more sense to hold that, discontinue that, because again, their body is in that shutting down process. Um, people worry about, well, they'll, they're starving to death. Um, and, and keep in mind that it's starvation is withholding food or fluids from someone who has the ability and desire to eat and drink. 
It is not, those aren't the circumstances at end of life. They don't have the ability to safely eat and drink. We're artificially um, giving them uh, food or fluids and, and you know, causing this um, imbalance in their body. And often when people are able to communicate when they haven't been drinking and they are dehydrated because that is part of end of life, it's not an uncomfortable process. Um, and actually for someone who's had been a little fluid overloaded, when they do begin to get dry, slightly dehydrated, they report that they feel more comfortable because the burden isn't on their body. So again, it, it's changing the way we think because we always think if someone's slightly dehydrated or in that process, that it causes discomfort. And at end of life, that does not appear to be the case. Um, some of the other things that we see, that we can see, are a change in the color of, of the patient's skin. And this is regardless of, of the skin color, race. Um, the, the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, inside your mouth are usually pink. Um, when the circulation is impaired, you begin to see in the palms of the hands, um, on the soles of the feet, almost a bluish tint there. Um, and sometimes it's like splotches of, of blue or purple. Uh, again, this is um, that the circulation is, is not adequate um, and the extremities can actually feel cool to touch. Uh, sometimes that will happen. And, and you'll see the coolness, um, you'll feel the coolness and see that change all the way up the legs. Um, and then it may resolve. Um, the heart tries very hard to, to pump adequately. So there may be some improvement, but then you notice that those changes again. These are all signs and symptoms that are, are normal as someone approaches end of life. Um, if the patient's verbal, they may tell you, they may be able to say that they uh, feel numb or they can't feel at all. And again, this is a circulatory thing um, that the blood supply is, is not adequate. Um, they may, their whole body may feel cool to touch. The temperature may actually um, be low or uh, sometimes we see in people with um, cancer diagnosis or brain involvement, that there may be a spike in the, in the temperature. Um, and it's not, it's not related to infection. It may just be where a tumor is um, or just um, involvement of the cancer. Uh, sometimes you actually see uh, the skin they're diaphoretic, they're clammy, they're very cool to touch. Um, blood pressure, if sometimes families have been checking their blood pressure and it may be extremely low, you may not even be able to palpate it. You may put the cuff on and it, it doesn't register. Um, certainly these are signs that the circulation, that the um, dying process is um, definitely getting near the end. Um, the pulse may become irregular. Sometimes we'll see the pulse get very, very quick, very rapid, um, thready, um, rapid, slow, and then not palpable at all. Um, changes in, in urine and uh, bowels. Uh, maybe this is someone who has been completely continent the entire time. They're able to tell you they need to use the bedpan, they need to use the bowels, they need to urinate, and now they're incontinent. Um, also, if it's someone who has a catheter and you can actually see the urine, you may see that it becomes very, very dark, uh, tea colored, um, because the kidneys are actually shutting down. Uh, sometimes it will appear bloody, um, can appear. Um, almost a maroon color. And again, these are not things we want to interfere with. We certainly don't want to, uh, at that point, do IV fluids because this is a sign that the kidneys are shutting down and the fluids would really be 
cause problems at that point. Um, loss of muscle control, the jaw dropping, this is maybe very near the end of life uh, where the person just has, you know, the, the muscle tone is completely gone, the muscle strength is completely gone. Um, and they may be holding their body in a very rigid state, but there is no movement, there's been no movement at all. If you try to hold their hand, they can't react at all. Um, again, these are things that you would see very close to the end of life. Hey, Sally, yes. just before you move on from this slide, we have a question um, from Judith. She asks, do you use morphine? So the use of morphine is not uncommon as somebody approaches end of life. And the reason for that would be if they are working hard to breathe. So morphine is a good medication for pain. However, it is the gold standard for breathing difficulties. Now, the amount that would be used is not the amount that someone would get for surgical pain or, or some kind of severe pain. It's a very, very small amount. We use a concentrated morphine so that even if this person is unresponsive, the uh, morphine can be, it's a liquid, can be put in their mouth and it just gets absorbed. And what it does is it will relieve that work of breathing. So if they're breathing 30 breaths a minute, when 18 is normal, if you try to breathe 30 breaths a minute, it's exhausting. And so the morphine will just bring those respirations down to a normal level. When someone is breathing that rapidly, it causes anxiety. And so the morphine will help with the anxiety. If you reduce the anxiety, you can also reduce that rate of breathing. So yes, the answer is we will use morphine if it's indicated. We're not going to use morphine if the respirations are normal, if they have no signs and symptoms of pain. It's not needed, um, but it is often available and it is often used um, to help with breathing at end of life. Okay, and just, uh, I think I missed the part about, do we use uh, nebulizers to administer it? Um, not usually. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, I remember there was a period of time when nebulized morphine was used a lot, and then it kind of was out of favor. I think it's questionable um, if you get better results from nebulized morphine or just the liquid morphine. So more often you see the very, very concentrated liquid. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, so the concentration we use is 20 milligrams per ml. Um, and oftentimes the starting dose is five milligrams, which is 0 0.25 mLs of liquid. That's a fraction of a teaspoon. There's five mLs in a teaspoon, and we're talking about 0.25, so this is a tiny, tiny amount that goes in the person's mouth that will be able to relieve those symptoms of um, dyspnea and work of breathing. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so having said all this about they're, they're unresponsive, um, you see these changes in breathing patterns, uh, people will tell you when someone approached the end of life, they sat up, they hadn't spoken for days, and they asked, where's mom or where's dad? And it seems like there's been a miracle. Um, how, how to explain that? I have no explanation. Does it happen? Absolutely. Not all the time. Not all the time. But it can happen. What I will tell people is enjoy that period of alertness and awareness. Um, and watch the next 12 to 24 hours because either this is a significant change that that shows some kind of improvement for some reason, or it is that um, surge of energy at end of life. So enjoy it and see what the next 12 to 24 hours bring because if it was that surge of energy, um, it, it won't continue. Um, but it, it certainly is something um, that time to enjoy that if that person has that period of awareness. 
so these are the signs and symptoms that we, we may see. And again, sometimes people have such a dramatic change that maybe they're talking um, one minute. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, with my mom at her end of life, um, the school bus used to go up her street every morning at 7.30. And at 7.30, the day she died, she said to me, what is, what's that sound I hear? And I said, Mom, it's 7.30, it's a school bus. That was the last thing she said. And within 10 minutes, she had died. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, not everyone is going to go through all these changes. But it's helpful, I think. Families tell us that they appreciate the fact that this they have some idea of what they can look for. At end of life, what do we see? The respirations have stopped. They no longer feel the pulse. They may lose control of bowel and bladder. Um, their eyes may just be fixed. Oftentimes they are open. The jaw slacks and, and the color. Um, if you've been with someone who has died, it's all of a sudden you look and, and realize the color is so dramatically different than uh, when they were still breathing. Um, so I think that what's also important to know is your comfort level. Um, I remember when I worked in the hospital decades ago, um, there were people who, who would say, I, I just don't feel comfortable being with someone um, at the end of life. There's no right or wrong here, but we need to know that because if our comfort level is, is um, or if we don't have a comfort level for, to be with someone at end of life, we need to find someone who can be there um, and let the person who, who feels uncomfortable, there's a lot of other things that they can be doing. People shouldn't be forced to be present if their discomfort is so great. Um, so we need to recognize that. So those are some of the things that we may see as people approach the end of life. Um, I think, again, if we um, can educate families and patients for what to expect, um, they may, in fact, be able to see this time um, like Rilke described as a gift. So any questions? Thank you so much, Sally. Um, now is your opportunity to ask Sally any questions you might have. Um, I don't see any in the chat box, but I'm gonna give you a minute or so. I know we're maybe two minutes over, three minutes over, but you have us here and Dr. Aziz with us. <laughs> um, to answer any questions that we were not able to address. Uh, Dr. Aziz, I actually have a question that we weren't able to get to earlier, which was from um, Judith, who asked about, um, she was wondering about doctor, what if someone's doctor can be the person's DPO? Doctor Aziz, were you? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can hear me now. Yes. So um, we have a question about if can the a per, can um. Let me pull up the question. She asks if someone's doctor can be um, a person's DPO. Oh, you mean the POA? Yes, I think that's what she meant. The, okay. can, can, can they be the power of attorney? Right. I I, I don't think that a physician like your your private physician can can be the POA as such. I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but the physician actually you don't necessarily need the physician as a POA because they already are on your side if you have their their your best interest at heart and uh, you have talked to them about your wishes. So uh, it, uh, it needs to be somebody who's not really 
connected because there is uh, uh, this um, uh, conflict of interest. Uh, there may be conflict of interest in uh, with the physician. So it's, it's not a good idea to do that. I think, I think that's it. Um, any other questions? If not, I have shared a link to our evaluation form. If you need, if, if you require to uh, a CE credit, it is essential for you to complete this form. Um, even if you don't need it, we really ask you to take a few minutes to complete the evaluation form. That helps us improve our programs. We really, I actually do read every comment that you send and try to incorporate it in our, our um, educational programs that we do here at Montgomery Hospice. These two programs, um, before I jump into you know the closing remarks, I do want to thank Dr. Aziz and Sally for their time. Um, I, I know you guys have a very busy schedule and we appreciate you taking the time to do um, these seminars for us. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank You're welcome. you. Uh, so these two programs do count as mandatory courses for the, the Montgomery Hospital Certificate in the NDEF Life Care Program. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the Montgomery Hospital uh, Certificate in the NDEF Life Care Program is a program that is for working professionals who wish to gain a greater insight and knowledge in the field of NDEF Life Care. Many of you here are only missing these two courses um, in order for you to graduate for, from the program this September, we're actually graduating our second cohort of um, I just realized that you couldn't hear me. Okay, <laughs> I see. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm talking to myself here. Okay, I apologize for that. So I, as I was saying, um, if you're not familiar with the Montgomery Hospital Certificate in Indef Life Care Program, this program is for working professionals who wish to gain a greater um, insight and knowledge about the field of Indef Life Care. We currently have about 300 people. Who are pursuing the program and some of you here with us are actually um, these are the two mandatory courses you need to graduate this September. We're graduating the second cohort of um, professionals this coming September. Um, what's unique about this program is that all you have to do to sign up for it is show interest. We have 10 courses that are so comprehensive um, from you know understanding what hospice is to eligibility, to having difficult conversations, to recognizing signs and symptoms of dying. Um, and then we also have a seminar that's um, on the, the opioids, how we use them, the truth about opioids. There are seven courses that are mandatory. Three of them are electives. Um, and we offer them many times, more, usually twice a year. Each program is offered twice a year. And before the pandemic hit, we actually did one in person and one online. But now that we're doing most of our programming online, we're offering them more often than not. We do offer continuing, educa continuing education credits for them, nurses, uh, social workers, and um, nursing home administrators. Most of the programs are completely free. So um, this is really meant to enhance your 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 learning process in general, and then hopefully you can take that and be able to expand it to your experiences with patients and, and families and have a better grasp of in just life care in general. So with that um, said, any all the PowerPoints um, that were shared, both Dr. Aziz's and um, Sally's, any content that was shared as a resource uh, to today's presentation, I'll I'll send it in the follow-up. If you're interested in the recording of this, it would be available on our YouTube channel um, in about two weeks. Um, if you w have any questions about where you are in terms of uh, your, 
your progress in the Certificate in In-Depth Life Care Program, you can always reach out to me and I'll be able to give you an update on that. So um, I think that's all I have for you today. I hope you have a great long weekend. I know this is a holiday weekend, so enjoy your weekend and stay safe, everyone. Bye. Oh, you can reach out to me um, via an email. I'm going to follow up with an email. You can just respond to the email that I sent.